help me in welcoming Dr. Lang. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you again today. Um, so today, what I was going to do, a little bit different than yesterday, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a couple of areas of drug delivery um, where we kind of rationally try to understand um, and design how you'd make certain things to help uh, first transdermal delivery and then actually aerosol delivery. But one of the things that I've watched is that you don't always, sometimes it's hard to understand everything. So the other innovation that we've tried to bring to bear in a lot of things is to design what I'll call high throughput processes, which sometimes involve combinations of new chemistry on the one hand, and even things like robotics on the other hand. So if we can't rationally figure it out, maybe we can come up with ways to do tens or hundreds of thousands of experiments just really fast so we'll hit on something. So I'm going to go over both those things. Let me start, though, with um, transdermal delivery. So transdermal delivery, I, now you've probably seen things like this patch. Um, is it up on? Is it? Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. So you've probably seen things like this patch. Um, you know, but if you were, if you went 30, a little more than 30 years ago, these didn't exist. So the idea, you know, for the longest time, people would always take pills or have implants. The idea of a patch you could put on the skin to deliver drugs was a real big changing concept. And it's enabled a number of drugs to be used that way. I would say that probably these are used something like on 20 million people a year. Uh, the, the sales of these are about $20 billion a year. So it's had a pretty substantial impact. That being said, there are only 20 drugs that people deliver this way. The reason for that is it's really hard to get a drug through the skin. In fact, you might think, well, isn't it bad if things get through the skin? And you'd actually be right to say that because you don't want bacteria or other things to get through the skin. skin the, 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 so what prevents things from getting through the skin? <clears throat> what prevents them from getting through the skin, interestingly enough, is the outermost layer of the skin. It's called the stratum corneum. It's, it's actually dead. It's only 15 cell layers thick. And it looks like you see here. It kind of looked like a brick wall. Dead cells called keratinocytes. And then these lipid bilayers, which is kind of like the mortar. That provides a real barrier for bacteria, drugs, anything to get through the skin. <clears throat> but some drugs have just the right property. You might not need very much, and they might have the right kind of what I'll call lipophilicity uh, to get through the skin, um, but only 20 drugs. So we've wondered for the last um, over 20 years, how can we change that? How can we make it, rather than 20 drugs, could it be hundreds of drugs or thousands of drugs? Well, the only way to do it is you have to enhance permeability. The reason so few drugs can go through the skin is that the flux is so low. So one of the ways that Yossi Coast, who was one of my uh, postdocs uh, a long time ago, and I started thinking about it, it Yossi, by the way, is Dean of Engineering at, uh, tech, at, at uh, Ben Gurion University now, but one of the ways we thought about doing this was using ultrasound. Ultrasound is actually an approved procedure for many different medical areas. It's at one megahertz, it's in therapeutics. I'm sure all of you have seen diagnostic or certainly heard of diagnostic ultrasound. That's how you image newborn babies. And even very low frequencies are used in dentistry and liposuction. And Yossi did some experiments when he was a postdoc showing that, uh, and this is just with a simple diffusion cell. This is standard chemical engineering kind of stuff. Uh, basically, you, oh, st stopped again. Oh, I should use this one, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, I pushed it on this, so I didn't know. Yeah, I just, okay, I keep using this one. Okay, um, so, so Yossi, uh, so what you do in these studies is that you put a layer 
of skin. Basically, you know, one of the big problems in medicine is always finding the right animal model, and is animal model good enough for humans? So here it's actually very easy. The, the stratum corneus I mentioned is dead skin, so the model people use is dead people. And, and they actually get human cadaver skin, and that's what they mount in these. And actually, that's a very good representation of what's really going to happen. So you put uh, human cadaver skin here, and you do a diffusion experiment, you see what you get. So what Yossi had found is that, I'm sorry, what, what, what Yossi had found, I, I'm, slowly but surely I'll figure this out. <laughs> you know, they, they don't teach you how to use these clickers at MIT. <laughs> So, so anyhow, um, what Yossi found was that was for some drugs, uh, without ultrasound, you got, and this is actually a drug with a pretty high flux, uh, estradiol. It's one of the transdermal patches. You get a little bit, but if you put ultrasound, you get a lot. So we made some publications, actually. The initial publications we did were in the Journal of Clinical Investigation in the 1980s. And we were very excited about this. And we thought, well, other people would use it. So a lot of people tried to, I don't want to say exactly repeat what we did, because they didn't. But what they did is they would do other experiments with ultrasound, because it looked like a good thing to do. And none of them worked. They kept saying that, you know, they tried other drugs, they tried other frequencies, none of them worked. So even though we had done this, and it was phenomenological, it wasn't being able to be extended to other drugs and other situations. So a couple years later, another graduate student, Samir Mitragatri, uh, joined our lab. Samir is now a professor at University of California at Santa Barbara. And, and Dan Blankstein, who was a colleague of mine, actually a physicist, chemical engineer, uh, helped us as well and co-supervised Samir. And so what we did is uh, we said, well, we've got to figure out what's going on. We've got to figure out the mechanism. We said, well, the candidate mechanisms, we picked four. Temperature, because ultrasound could heat things up. Convective transport through hair follicles. By the way, if anybody's ever looked at electricity, there's a whole area called uh, ionophoresis. That's how that works. You get, uh, you, get, you get convective transport through hair follicles and sweat ducts, but you get very low fluxes because there's so little of those. Third is uh, ultrasound is actually a pressure wave, so you get mechanical oscillations of the lipid bilayers. And the fourth, was cavitation. Cavitation is like opening up a bottle of champagne. And you get these bubbles. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and the thought was maybe they'll cause a disordering of the lipid bilayers. So Samir analyzed these step by step. We saw no temperature increase. And temperature didn't have that much of an effect anyhow on some of these things. So then we checked um, convective transport. If that were important, we, he took about 10 different drugs. If it was important, you'd see flux independent of drug lipophilicity, and you'd see enhancement of charged drugs through the hair follicles. But we observed exactly the opposite. What we saw is the sonophoretic flux was proportional to drug lipophilicity and no enhancement of charged drugs. So we felt that this is not important. So then we looked at mechanical effects. From the literature, you know that mechanical effects are proportional to frequency. Again, we observed exactly the opposite, so we concluded that the first three mechanisms were not key. So that would leave you with the fourth mechanism, cavitation. So Samir did some experiments to look at that. And one of the things that you could imagine with cavitation is that there's something called the cavitation threshold. If you go, at, and, and that's the threshold above which the bubbles are no longer stable. So the idea is eventually, you know, it's going like this. So let's say if you go above 1.5 me, megahertz, it will you'll go above it and it won't be stable. And what you see, interestingly, is that when you go above that threshold, the flux goes almost to back to normal, one. Uh, this is the enhancement ratio. Yet, if you're below it, you get this big ratio. So I said to Samir, that's, so Samir said, well, now we know that this is the mechanism. I said, that's good, but you know, it's always good if you could do a second experiment to really prove it. So another thing is that um, if cavitation is important, if you put it under really high pressure, it's hard for that to happen. So he put it under 30 atmosphere pressure, and the effect goes away. So he said, now I've done it two ways, and we know that that's got to be the mechanism. I said, yeah, that's good, but it's, it's really good if you could do it a third way, too. <laughs> so he went back, and 
again, if cavitation, uh, the only way it could happen is you have to have gas in the skin. So he degassed it, and again, the effect went away. Uh, so it made us think that cavitation really ought to be the mechanism. So just to draw a picture, um, what we were thinking about is there's always dissolved gas, and uh, if, if you have dissolved gas, that could cause a disordering of these lipid bilayers. So one of the things you always want to do at MIT is develop mathematical models to predict these things. Somebody asked me that yesterday about some things. And so Samir developed a, a, a very simple mathematical model to do this. Basically, we're saying the reason for enhancement tra of transport is uh, uh, bilayer disordering. Ultrasound will disorder a fraction of bilayers. And by the way, you can, we actually observe this. We can actually even see this on ourselves. What you can do is if you put ultrasound on the skin and you measure uh, the conductivity of the skin, uh, you, you, can actually, you, you can actually see it change. Um, and then there are models that were in the literature uh, for diffuse, there's like a Wilkie-Chang equation for diffusivity through disordered lipids. And then actually David Edwards, who worked with me, also developed a, a model for diffusivity through normal lipid bilayers. So we'd plug all these in and we'd measure the data. And when we did, the predictions were not bad. The red bars, the red lines here, what you're looking at is enhancement ratio, one being no enhancement, over these two diffusivities. The red bars bound what we ought to see if the predictions are right. And interestingly, what you observe is for some drugs, just like people said, there's absolutely no effect, no effect at all. For some drugs, there's a moderate effect. For some drugs, there's like estradiol, which we had observed, there's a very big effect. And you could actually predict that. So the value of this is that it showed us that um, it, it showed us that this was uh, the mechanism, but uh, or, or that you could even predict these things. But it also gives you insight. And the insight that it gives you is if cavitation is the mechanism, what it really told us when we looked at the literature is we weren't really operating in the right place. Cavitation, if you look in the literature, is inversely proportional to ultrasound frequency. We had been doing it here in our original paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Actually, a lot of times when people repeated what we did, they actually operated up here. They have very high frequencies because that's you know, how people had done imaging for babies. What this tells you is that all of us were operating under the wrong conditions. We really want to operate at low frequencies. And that's what we did. So we started operating at low frequencies, and then we got incredibly dramatic effects. This was published in Science. Uh, as, as, and we showed that you could get even fairly large quantities. This is taking an hour of delivery. But you could get fairly large quantities even of peptides and proteins being delivered. And then we also showed. Uh, that if you took insulin, you could actually lower the blood sugar level. So then our next goal, just like I talked about in a lot of examples yesterday, is to get this to humans. So actually, this is I'm almost embarrassed to say, but Samir and actually, and, and, and actually uh, um, some of the other students, they actually want to test it on themselves, even though they really shouldn't. Lon did not, though. He'd, uh, but, uh, but anyhow, they, so uh, they, this is actually an example. I actually took sonicators. You could put a little liquid on. I should point out I even did it myself, too. It's just sort of irresistible. So, you, know, <laughs> to, you, 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 you sort of got to know whether it's to, in, fa in fact, I'll just tell you, this, this is, oh, this is being recorded. Maybe I won't. Uh, but, any, but, 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 uh, but, you know, but, this, but anyhow, people would try it. And, and, um, <laughs> And, and, and uh, it, it, it really worked well. In fact, sometimes people ask me, well, does it hurt? And actually, I would say it's not like there's zero sensation. The sensation is actually milder than a shower, much milder than a shower. But you can sort of tell it's something, you know, that there's a little bit of, of, of sensation, but very, very little. So we did these studies. And then a company even got started by Yossi and Samir. And they actually developed a product that got uh, called, was the, um, I guess, that uh, Popular Science gave the prize of the year a few years ago, which is a sauna prep. And, and just, just to show you what was done, it was FDA approved. And this is five minutes later, they got it to two minutes. But the idea, and I don't know if people have had this happen, this was just the earliest uh, example, is that you'd put it on the skin, 
There's something called emla cream. If you ever have some operations on the skin where they want to put catheters or other things, they, they put this emla cream on. Problem is it takes over an hour to work. Now you put this, you put the sauna prep on top of it, works in five minutes and even two minutes. So that FDA approved that. And then what's being worked on are, are lots of other things. Uh, there's still work going on for possibly getting rid of, of, of needles. But the other thing that was interesting, see if you could deliver drugs through the skin, that means you know, you're creating new pathways. That's, that's sort of what we're seeing. So if things can transport one way, then they also should transport the other way, right? So what was done, uh, again, by uh, Yossi and Samir and others, is to do a simple test where they'd have a donor compartment. Here's the skin. But now you're going to look and see whether analytes could diffuse from here to here. And then you could test them. So what was done is uh, for glucose is uh, the, the, there's a whole type of special curve that you can do. And what they did is when they did the curve, you basically, if you're in the A or B region, uh, basically you get very, very accurate glucose measurements. So they're comparing sonophoretic glucose to venous glucose levels, and they're essentially identical. And this is in very advanced clinical trials right now by uh, Echo, uh, Echo Therapeutics, which is, uh, uh, took over from Santra. And someday, you may be able to analyze a lot of things. Uh, these are just nine different analytes analyzed this way. So the whole hope about all this is that you could make it much easier for children and adults. You wouldn't need to use needles. Um, and you could give things non-invasively like this. So this was one idea that we had, and still going, uh, uh, being very much explored with one FDA approval and hopefully more. Another one that we thought about to do things non-invasively, I'm sort of doing this a little bit in contrast to what I talked about yesterday where we had all the invasive things like microspheres and wafers. So, so basically now we have a non-invasive way to do transdermals. Could we have a non-invasive way to do lung delivery? <coughs> So lung delivery, let me tell you a little bit about that. So lung delivery uh, is an incredibly inefficient thing. If you take, if you take uh, inhale something you, uh, from an inhaler, you're lucky if you get 2% of the drug from the device into the lung. And the reason for that is it all set, you know, is basically uh, people always thought that the particles, the aerosols, have to be really small, otherwise they all settle in the back of your throat. But the problem is, is when you make an aerosol really small, there's enormous surface area, and, and it aggregates and sticks together. It's kind of like wet sand. So how did people try to solve this? Generally, they'd use mechanical engineering approaches. And what they do is they design better and better inhalers to break apart this kind of sand-like aggregates. And then you could hopefully get more in. And actually made some progress. They made, there's probably about 40 or 50 companies that made better inhalers, ac academic groups as well. And what happened when they did this is that you could go from 2% sometimes to 3%. And actually, that's significant because you're decreasing your cost by 50%. But also, the biggest problem with the inhalers is their large size. Because, see, so many drugs you can't take that way because you'd have to carry this giant canister. Now you've decreased it by 50%. But interestingly, nobody. Nobody ever thought about changing the aerosol. In other words, everybody worked on changing the aerosolizer. Now, you might think, how could you change the aerosol? Isn't that just water with something in it? And you would probably be right. But a few people, even when we started in the early 90s, had made dry powder aerosols. But interestingly, everybody that was involved in this, whether they made water, uh, you know, like uh, meter dose inhalers or nebulizers or dry powder inhalers, in every single case, the density of the aerosols was the same as the density of water, about one gram per cc. So David Edwards was working with me, and it's interesting. He, when he first joined our lab, he had done, uh, written two books and 30 papers. He'd never really done an experiment. He'd always done mathematical modeling. And so when he came to the lab, the first thing he worked on was actually transdermal delivery and modeling that. And I remember when he first came to us, the first paper he gave me uh, to work on had over 300 equations in it. And I always felt my big contribution was reducing it to 250. <laughs> but then I said to him, you know, there's this area, this pulmonary delivery area that I think that we could work on, and I think maybe we could make a significant impact, because he'd done some modeling of the lung. So what we basically talked about um, was that maybe what we could do, let me just find my, uh, it's on the podium, thank you. Read my mind. <laughs> so what we could do is 
change aerosol design. So before we were involved, every aerosol was always small, like two microns, and non-porous. We tried to do a very simple thing. We said we'll make them larger, like 10 microns, but very porous. And that paradigm, we thought, could change everything. Because see, the big aerosols, he modeled them, shows that you can go into the deep part of the lung. Um, but because they're big, the surface area is very different, and they won't stick together like wet sand. In other words, wet basketballs are not going to aggregate to the same degree as wet sand. Also, when they do go into the lung, we thought they should last longer. Because you have macrophages in the lung, and whenever they see a small aerosol, they eat it. It's like eating a small meal. Now, the big aerosol, it's like eating a big meal. It's going to take a lot longer. So we thought this could change everything. So anyhow, we had a bunch of people in our lab. Uh, Justin Haynes, who's now at Johns Hopkins as a professor, Giovanni Caponetti, um, uh, Jeff Hercash, Noah Luton, and they made these aerosols. And I'll give you a simple, I know this is a big sports school, so I'll give you a big a sports analogy. So before we were involved, if you looked under a microscope at any aerosol that anybody ever designed, it looked like a little golf ball or a little baseball, right? Density of one. All we did is change them to look like wiffle balls. I mean, it's that simple. This is a scanning electron micrograph. We make them very simple procedures like spray drying, and all they are is like big wiffle balls. That changed, and we published this in Science a few years ago, that changes everything. I'll just show you a few examples. Um, and it really changed the whole aerosol field. Basically, uh, uh, before, and, and David uh, Edwards was also elected to the National Academy of Engineering for this work, won a number of big AICHE awards. So basically, uh, non-porous, this is a, an in vitro experiment, you get about a tenfold increase. If you do an in vivo experiment, again, these are different lobes of the lung, again, you get about a tenfold increase. Uh, and we even did human experiments, and you can make them last for three days. And David, uh, we started a very successful company. I, I actually even have a business lecture sometimes I give, which I won't give today. But basically, we started a company called AIR. It's called Advanced Inhalation Research, but it kind of mimics these aerosols, right, which are largely air and can be inhaled. And uh, that everybody wanted to use these aerosols. So the, comp the, so the investors who put money in it got what's called over 1,000% IRR. That means, you know, like if you put it in the bank, you get about 1% or 2% IRR. So they did OK. Um, <laughs> and, and like I say, almost everybody wanted to, what, began using this. And it's been, uh, variations are used for diabetes, to de Parkinson's, all kinds of different things. Um, so at any rate, uh, so these two stories that I wanted to tell you on transdermal and aerosols, so what we did here in both cases is we really tried to get at the fundamentals of understanding what was going on, and then totally change the design using engineering approaches to solve these problems. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, you can't always do this. So another idea I had was a number of years ago, um, some people were talking to me, and they said, you know, the biggest problems in the pharma, two of the biggest problems in the pharmaceutical industry have to do with formulation. And let me just go over what happens in the pharmaceutical industry. Usually what happens is you have, uh, a, a, a drug company, and they do drug discovery, and then they may do animal work and everything else. Finally, they get to the very last stage, which means formulation. That's the way you'll actually use it. But the problem is when you get to formulation, I'd say 50% of the time, the drug doesn't go into solution. And the other big problem that comes up, or one other big problem that comes up, is, is shelf life. You know, like when you take a drug, you don't take it when you first buy it. You might wait months. Sometimes people wait years. So usually you need a shelf life. The key to that is having the drug in what's called the right polymorph form so that moisture won't get in and change it. So uh, I'd say, so here what we did when we actually started a company on this called Transform Pharmaceuticals was two other of my students, David Putnam, who's now a professor at Cornell, and Hung Ming Chen, who now is VP of another company we started. But basically, we started it to uh, do um, high throughput development. And the idea was, before we got involved, what would happen in a large pharmaceutical company is they maybe would do 10 or 20 experiments, maybe to get the drug in the right solution. Uh, it might take them a couple months. And then they wouldn't really analyze what happened. We thought, why can't we change this paradigm? Why can't you use robots and, and other approaches to do hundreds of thousands of experiments, do it faster, because the robots are going to work all night, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of them. 
Uh, and whenever we get data, why can't we analyze it? So I'm going to show you a video now, and I'm just going to give you a preview of that video. And, and, and I know somebody, you're going to help me? Good. But uh, you can see how adept I am with all these things. But uh, so at any rate, but I'll just give you a preview in the video. So what I'm going to show you in the video is actually what happened in the company. We have uh, little robots where you, the first thing is in crystallization to make polymorphs. So what we do is rather than do them by hand, we have like little hotel rooms almost. There's going to be different seating conditions, which could be different temperatures, uh, different surfaces, and so forth. And we're going to see uh, what kind of crystals we get. We're going to analyze them several ways. Melting temperature, um, uh, Raman x-ray diffraction, and so forth. Uh, Raman spectroscopy, x-ray diffraction, so three different methods. So I'm going to show you that, and then at the end I'm going to show you a set of experiments on solubility. But if we could just go to the video. And this will just give you an idea of what happens in the company. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, the, this is the, and all this is done by, by the robots. It just puts the, plates the material in. These are all the different rooms, so to speak, that have different uh, uh, conditions. This is x-ray diffraction. It gives you a fingerprint. This is going to give you melting temperature. And what you'll see in a second is real-time Raman spectroscopy, thousands of these being analyzed in seconds. So you get different fingerprints. The computer then takes all those fingerprints and does what's called binning them. And when it bins them, it puts them on top of each other. Turns out there's three different crystal forms, one, two, and three. So that's all you get. You get three different crystal forms here. But what's been done, and I'll give you an example in a second, in a minute, is in literally a couple days, we did the amount of experiments that a company might have taken five or 10 years to do. And so we find all different things that you couldn't find before. Let me go over the solubility one for a second. Dave Putnam did this. So the solubility one was a little bit different. But basically, what we did here is people would usually add one excipient, one substance, see if it improved solubility. We would add a lot of different ones. And let's say the goal is to go above this dash line. Well, here you're below it, hundreds of experiments. But, you analyze, but a few go above it. And you analyze the chemical structure of these on the computer, do informatics. And then you say, um, let's do it again with the best ones uh, we predict. And now you see you do better still. You analyze the structure of these, redo the experiments intelligently, and you do better still. So you're able to up the solubility and hopefully solve this problem. So I was just going to give you two examples, one verbally and one experimentally, that we did. So with solubility, one of the big things is transdermal drug delivery. So we set up a situation where if you can increase the solubility, you might be able to increase the transport. So we set up a high-throughput system, and we actually did an arrangement with ALSA, which was the pioneer of these transdermal systems. And Transform did more studies in one month than ALSA did in 30 years. Second example uh, was actually even more interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And there. We took a real life example that was a real medical problem. In the AIDS area in the, in the 1990s, and still today, one of the most important drugs are these protease inhibitors. Can we? Uh, no, I think we're back to the beginning. Oh, you did it. OK. so. One of the, 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 these protease inhibitors, and one of the most popular ones for a long time was a drug that Abbott made called Norvir or Ritonavir. And, but what happened was, which was sad, is that a year and a half after they made it and got FDA approval, for some reason, it converted into an unanticipated crystal form, a different polymorph. It was 50% lot soluble, and so Abbott, I mean, the FDA told them, take it off the market. It doesn't work the same way. So they couldn't sell it for a couple of years. People couldn't use it. Um, so they went from Form 1 to Form 2. They spent a year and a half trying to get it back to Form 1. They never were able to. So ultimately, they had to put it in a solution form, which wasn't so popular, didn't work so well, and you know, lost their total market share. In two, so seven years later, we came along at Transform. And in two weeks, in just two weeks, what we did is we made Form 1, we made Form 2, and we discovered three forms that nobody ever discovered before. Again, just the value of high throughput work. Um, and Transform ultimately, it was ultimately acquired by Johnson & Johnson, but got three different products approved by the FDA. 
Now, one of the other things we thought about is that you can really apply these high throughput things, combined sometimes with new chemistries, to some real big biological problems that we were interested in. One of them uh, was, is gene therapy. Uh, gene therapy is, is still a huge problem. Uh, when Inder Verma, who is now uh, at the Salk, was head of the uh, Gene Therapy Society, uh, he was asked, what's the biggest problem uh, with gene therapy? He says, just three, delivery, delivery, and delivery. People had tried uh, viral vectors, but they weren't safe. They tried synthetic materials like lipids and polymers. They weren't effective. So I had a postdoc in my lab, David Lin. He actually did his PhD with Bob Grubbs and Bob uh, at Caltech in the 90s. And Bob called me up and said, this is the best guy he's ever had. Uh, and could he come to our lab? And uh, when David came, one of the things he did, he got very interested in this area, and he basically used Michael additions. And his idea was that, again, nobody has a clue of what makes the right viral vector work or other things. But again, why can't we make, and, and people had not made, people had done high throughput synthesis of, of low molecular materials, but it's very challenging to do high throughput synthesis of high molecular materials. So what, what Dave did is basically, uh, take amines and, and acrylates, and he could combine this on a one-to-one -one basis. And you could see the biggest problem, as people may know, is if you try to make a polymer, usually you start out with a small molecule, and then you want to do a reaction, so you've got to block certain functional groups. Then you do your reaction, then you have to unblock them, you have to purify, and so forth. It may take 40 or 50 steps to make the polymer. The beauty of what David did is now it's done in a single step. You don't get byproducts or protection or need protection or deprotection. So you could do this in a high throughput basis. Now I put Dave actually in the same office with a very good molecular biologist in our lab, Dan Anderson. And so what they did is they worked out ways to not only synthesize thousands of these, as I'll show you, but screen them for gene therapy and other things pretty quickly. And so here is, uh, nobody should take this down, but uh, Basically, what they did is pick 94 amino monomers and 25 diacrylate monomers, and they reacted each of these with each of these. And the only thing I want you to notice is chemical diversity, enormous chemical diversity. So they synthesized all these, made over 2,000 polymers. And some of them worked really well. Uh, this is an example, for example, of trying to uh, use their vectors to transfect cells. Um, at, at, and this is like a... Uh, you can see they actually were able to get much higher expression with a conventional um, synthetic material, but even better than adenovirus. They also did this with stem cells, with Rudy Janish, one of our collaborators. They were able to transfect uh, human embryonic stem cells very effectively. And today, uh, this has already led to a number of reagents and various uh, other examples of using these in various uh, trials. Now, that enabled us to deliver DNA, but we also were thinking, could we ever deliver siRNA? In other words, DNA could uh, sort of give you gain of function. siRNA could shut function off. That's really challenging, and I've been fortunate to be an advisor of, to Al Nylum since the beginning, uh, and so we've worked closely with them. And what Dan Anderson, and, and, and there, the, what people have wanted to use were lipids, like liposomes. So here, what uh, what Dan Anderson started thinking about, he's now a professor at MIT too, was that before we got involved, so the first liposomes would be published in about eight, 1960 by Alex Bangham. But what's happened, unfortunately, is that there are only about 40 lipids that have ever been used, and maybe 10 predominantly. And these hadn't worked very well for delivering siRNA, particularly in vivo. So what we started thinking about is why can't we make thousands of these? You know, people don't know what makes them work anyhow, but why can't we make thousands and find one that might work? So he basically used the same type of chemistry, the acrylate to the amine, and we changed the R group. And we did make a tremendous number of different lipids. So these are, again, just to give you an idea of the diversity, these are all the different lipids we might make. Uh, we could also not just change the R groups, but we could change the, uh, the tails, could be changed, like the length and the structure, and even the number, like five, four, and three. So we had all different kinds of lipids, thousands, and we found some that worked really well. And what we did 
is that we could actually, and the beauty of sRNA is its specificity. You can knock down genes without, you know, a single gene without knocking down other things. Most drugs don't do that. Most drugs have hit many targets. So anyhow, here what you can see is with some of these vectors, you can get very specific knockdown of factor seven. Um, same with this, but here we can get very specific knockdown of ApoB, which will encode for cholesterol. And we showed, we actually got the cover of Nature Biotech, that's here, also published in Nature and Cell, that some of these lipids like this one, you could give it, and see here's the control, no lowering of factor seven, but here, one injection probably lasts for nearly 30 days. You can do this over and over and there's really no change. And the animals seem to be pretty safe. Also, you can get a dose response curve. Um, and you can give more and more and get total knockdown. And then this is just an example for cholesterol. You could uh, knock down after two days. This is actually in monkeys and primates. Uh, you could actually lower the LDL cholesterol by a factor of 50% in two days. So that might mean, for example, if somebody had a cholesterol 300, now it's 150. So we were all very excited about this, but there's still some big challenges with siRNA delivery. And one of the things is the amount that we have to give. Probably the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges in this area is to lower the dose of the siRNA you give, because sometimes there's some side effects. So we, even with these lipids, still had amounts that were higher than everybody wanted. So basically, um, Kevin Love in our lab, working with Dan and others, Dan Seiger, we basically used an epoxide chemistry where we took the best examples that we had up till now, the best examples, and um, we basically um, would react these with these, and we would make another library uh, with epoxide terminated tails and tested them in vitro and then in vivo. And now what you're able to do is go from this uh, system where we're in the mig per kg range to this where you're really in the microgram per kg range. You can basically now low, get, uh, and, and we've continued to push along these combinatorial approaches. So now we can actually get knocked down, uh, you know, really with just a few micrograms per, ki per kg. Uh, and you can even do this in, in primates. So this is, uh, and, and these are actually in clinical trials, ways of knocking down uh, TTR. You can actually, again, do this in, uh, you know, with very, very small amounts. And here's an example that uh, Dan Anderson did, where he basically knocked down uh, something like over 10 genes uh, with a single uh, cocktail. So you could even, you know, knock out entire pathways. I don't know that this is ever going to get used clinically. I mean, it may be hard to get FDA approval, but as a, as, as just a demonstration of what you can do, it's quite powerful. So basically, you can use these high throughput methods for a variety of things. And I thought I would just end with one additional thing, since Lon, Lon mentioned, you know, one of the other big areas that we we're interested in is tissue engineering. And in the stem cell area, which uh, people talked about uh, a lot in the media, uh, the way it's almost always studied is with different materials in the media. In other words, you change you growth factors and things like that to try to solve problems like cell growth and differentiation. And interestingly, there's almost been no work on how insoluble factors, like the surfaces that the cells sit on, how they can affect um, the, 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 the uh, stem cells or other cells. So we wanted to ask, could we identify polymers? Could we create new tools where we could create polymers that could control cell behavior? Now, there's a lot of problems with this. Testing gene expression, which is how you're going to judge whether you've done that, it requires tedious, expensive methods. Fluid handling also uh, could, could, could raise some issues. And some cells, like stem cells, are expensive and difficult to grow in large quantities. So what uh, Dan Anderson thought about was why can't we use microarrays why can't we develop high throughput approaches where we'll literally have microarrays of hundreds if not thousands of materials and we'll see how the cells do. So what we wanted to do in this is synthesize large numbers, and I mean thousands, of new materials in nanoliter volumes, attach those materials to something as simple as a microscope slide um, in a manner that's compatible with all kinds of different materials, but where these materials will be compatible in a water environment. In other words, they shouldn't dissolve. And the cell growth, as I'll show you, should be 
because we want to look at discrete polymer spots. So we want the cells to grow in the polymer spots, but not in between them. And finally, we want to have simple simultaneous assays of different cellular markers. So once again, here we made a library. The library we used here, uh, the polymers are shown here. This is an acrylate library. Acrylates, by the way, I mean, they've been used in dentistry for a long time, so we thought we could use it here. And basically, the idea is that uh, all you have to do is shine a light on it, and you'll get it to polymerize. So we could take different ones of these and combine them with each other to make copolymers uh, and uh, plate them on a microscope slide. And that's what we did. Basically, what's done is you have a microscope slide. You put a polymer on it, like a polyhydroxyethylmethacrylate, which we find cells will not adhere to. And then you just have a robot put different polymer drops on. And you could do up to, say, well, in this case, 1,700 different spots. And what you see in this slide, here's the microscope slide with the spots. Here's a close-up. Here's an even bigger close-up. And here's one where we colored it. But you can put up to 3,500 polymer compositions on a single slide. But the cells only grow on the spots, not in the spaces between them, just because of the polymer we plated down in between them. So with that in mind, uh, you could do 70,000 experiments in a matter of a few days. You could take 20 slides, put up to 3,500 spots, add different things to each of them to check conditions like media, growth factors, different time points, and then study what happens on those 20 slides with 3,500 each. That could be done with uh, tools like for DNA chips and so forth. So I thought I would just end the talk with two simple experiments that we did. Well, maybe they're not that simple, but, um, <clears throat> but the first one is, can we, you know, yesterday I talked about making new skin. Could you convert human embryonic stem cells to epithelial cells? So what uh, was done by Dan, this was published in Nature Biotech, is that you could have different spots, but if you have cytokeratin, that should be green. And you see a couple that do that. If you ha and these could you know, be markers, for example, for epithelial cells. Red, purple's vimentin, and the polymer's blue. And then what he did is check the growth. And what you can see is some surfaces the cells grow really well on. This has been a challenge for stem cells in some cases. Some cells, some surfaces, they don't grow on at all. Some are intermediate. And then finally, in this set of experiments, uh, what he's doing is changing all the chemical compositions and adding different things. So you find, add retinoic acid, which is a growth factor at day six. Or you pulse it at day six. Or you don't add it at all. You add it at day one. Or you don't add it at day one. And what you see when you do all these thousands and thousands of experiments is you identify materials and conditions that can support the growth of human embryonic stem cells. You can also find conditions that stop it. You can find polymers that support the growth only in certain media and polymers that support the growth only of certain cell types. So this we published a, a number of years ago. And then we thought we could take it one step further. And I'm sorry, one of the biggest problems And it never got a lot of publicity, but one of the biggest problems, and this is true for human embryonic stem cells and for iPS cells, uh, uh, you know, that when people grow them, they're always, they don't grow them on a simple surface. They actually grow them on what are called mouse embryonic fibroblast feeder layers. What that means is that when you make these cells, they're sitting on a surface like this, right next to the mouse embryonic fibroblast, and they're passages of small cells, clumps of cells. Now, it's going to be challenging to genetically engineer them, but there's some additional problems. First, the production of these mouse embryonic feeder layers is laborious, and it limits the large-scale production of these human uh, embryonic stem cells. Secondly, and, and the thing that's certainly scary to me, is that if you're going to put these cells and you want to use them in a person, they're sitting there with mouse stuff being secreted right into the medium. And, you know, people, I'm sure people are familiar with the fact that Cows, for example, can transmit terrible diseases. There's no treatment. So now you have animal pathogens and animal immunologic protein contamination every single time you do this. And that's the state of the art. So we felt here's another opportunity to maybe use these, some of these high throughput things to do something. Now, I should point out what we and others had done even before this is say, well, could you use a synthetic substrate? Uh, and when we want to use a synthetic substrate, there's different ones that came up, but none of them, whether it was from our lab, like uh, um, 
that, 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 that we did uh, or others uh, really worked that well. None of them supported efficient growth. They were all less than 10%. None of them supported long-term growth, and none of them supported clonal growth of single human cells. So here we collaborated with Rudy Janish. He's at the Whitehead. He's probably one of the best stem cell guys in the world. And what we did is, again, take a library of polymers, shown here, and we'd copolymerize each of these with each of these. And that's shown here. You take acrylate 1 with acrylate 2, you put a photo initiator, and you have these libraries. So we, again, had thousands of polymers. And what, the way these were done, this was all published in Nature Materials, is we take these thousands of polymers, we'd screen for two of the things that, uh, that were key for stem cell, uh, you know, SSEA4 and OC4. And if those are there, then you have stem cell-like characteristics. What we found in particular when I showed you those monomers is that monomer 9, copolymerized with uh, monomer A, showed about the same efficiency. Uh, as the mouse embryonic feeder layers. In fact, now, using some further modification, we've got ones that I think work even better. We also wanted to get at the mechanism, so we developed high-throughput methods of analyzing third surface roughness with atomic force microscopy. Uh, in fact, a lot of this was done in collaboration with Martin Davies uh, at, um, at Nottingham, who developed some high-throughput approaches. Hydrophobicity, where we could do contact angles. Elastic modulus, we here collaborated with Kristen Van Vliet at MIT, who developed some high throughput approaches with Dan and ourselves on, on testing that. And none of those correlated. What it did correlate with were certain chemical structures shown here. Uh, those with hydrocarbon ions, ions from esters, and ions from cyclic structures. But what was really exciting was that after 10 passages, you got full pluripotent potential as uh, judged by multiple passages, by multiple markers. These five markers, all we looked at, karyotype and then gene expression into all three germ lineages. And the final systems chemically defined, xeno-free and feeder-free, and now being used uh, uh, really as a substitute for uh, some of these feeder layers. So you can apply these actually to a lot of other problems as well. We even actually, if people followed some of our work, we even actually applied it to hair. You can even use some of these new materials to come up with things that uh, make your hair thicker and stuff like that. And, but you can apply these high throughput things to almost anything. Um, and really, in situations where you really don't have a good enough understanding of, of what's going to work, it can be transformative in terms of what it can do. So I'm going to stop here. But um, again, it's been an honor to speak to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.